middle of the week. Welcome to our continued coverage of Hurricane Dorian's search and recovery. I'm LaDawn Davis. Thank you so much for waking up with us. Uh, temperatures are comfortable on the outside, and to tell us more about weather conditions is meteorologist Basil Dean. Good morning, Basil. This weather report is sponsored by Bank of the Bahamas, the bank of solutions. Good morning, LaDawn. Our tower cam showing just a few clouds floating around the, the islands uh, this morning as we take you now to our satellite picture to see what's happening with Humberto at uh, 5 o'clock this morning. It was located at 570 miles west of Bermuda. It's moving toward the east-northeast at about 8 miles per hour. Maximum sustain will still holding at 90 miles per hour, making it a category one hurricane. But that is expected to intensify during the course of the day as it makes that trek towards uh, Bermuda. But watch this trailing trough that affected the northwest bombers now moving into the central bombers. So that will be firing up some showers and thunderstorms in the vicinity of Cat Island, the Exumas, and uh, Long Island area as that trough continues to drag towards the east. The forecast for Humberto will take it well to the north and west of Bermuda sometime on Thursday morning. But outside of our studios just now, we are partly cloudy skies, temperature 81 degrees, relative humidity 83 percent. The winds are out of the northwest at 6 miles per hour. Your barometric pressure, 1,012.3 millibars. That's 29.89 inches, and it is steady. Temperatures this morning around the islands, Marsh Harbor 78, Green Toll Key and Abaco 78, Freeport 78 degrees as well in the Berry Islands 83, Alistair Bimini 83 degrees, 82 in Harbor Island, Rock Sound, Elutra, Otter Sound, Cat Island, 80 in Samuel Key, that's in the Exuma chain, also Kemp Space on Andros at 80, 81 in Fresh Creek Central Andros, San Salvador 82, Rim Key 82 degrees in Ragged Island, Clarence Sound, Long Island, Crooked Island 81, 82 in Betsy Bay, Maguana, Acklands at 82, Magitani, Nagua 82, and the Turks and Caicos Islands at 82. 83 degrees. Your boating forecast for today in the northwestern islands, northwest winds 12 to 18 knots, wave fights 3 to 6 feet. High tide 929 this morning, low tide at 346 in the afternoon. For the central Bahamas today, southwest winds 10 to 15, wave fights 2 to 4 feet in the southeast, light and variable winds, flat seas 1 to 3 feet over the ocean. And that's going to do it for your first look at weather in the morning edition. Stay tuned. Your forecast for today tonight is still ahead. Thanks a lot, Basil. Meanwhile, our Lloyd Allen in the Morning Edition team is standing by with the Bahamas First Traffic Report. The Traffic Report is sponsored by Bahamas First. First in insurance, today, tomorrow. Well, good morning, LaDon. Good morning, Bahamas. An interesting morning this morning. We're here near the intersection of Fire Trail Road and Gladstone Road, where police have unfortunately reported an incident unfolding in this area. And so, of course, we want to guide and advise drivers who are approaching this area to uh, approach with due care and attention. We're also joined this morning by uh, uh, Constable, or rather Corporal, uh, Wims uh, from the Royal Bahamas Police Force giving us a, a, a look at overnight traffic report. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm good. Good morning, Bahamas. Good morning, Mr. Alling. All right. So, so what does traffic look like over the past 24 hours? Well, last night we were reporting one traffic accident with minor damages. Uh, however, over a period of 24 hours, we were reporting 19 total accidents, 18 of them accidents, minor damages, and one hit and run. Wow. Sounds uh, very serious. Um, I also uh, wanted to ask, um, obviously uh, we're now back into the school um, runs uh, early morning um, and I know a lot of drivers tend to uh, use side streets as well, you know, trying to get to their destinations more, um, more speedily. Uh, what advice can you give them as they use those side corners? Well, we want to also uh, always advise persons to plan their route, plan ahead and make conscious decisions when operating motor vehicles. All right. Thank you so much. And of course, uh, that is a brief look at your traffic report this morning. Reporting from Gladstone Road, LaDawn, back to you. It's a lot, Lloyd. Now onto our top story this morning. Close to 600 faculty and students at the University of the Bahamas North Campus in Freeport were left displaced after Hurricane Dorian destroyed buildings of that campus. While it's a setback for University of the Bahamas officials, they say they are thankful for the support they received from international partners to get back on track. The morning team caught up with the head of the university for an update on their rebuilding efforts. President of the University of the Bahamas, Dr. Rodney Smith, says the damages sustained to the university's north campus after Hurricane Dorian are quite extensive. 
Nothing on the ground floor could have been salvaged, but fortunately, some of the items on the second floor were saved. After conducting an initial assessment of the Freeport campus last week, Smith gave ZNS News a detailed report on the damages incurred at the administrative complex and Hawksbill Hall residential facility. We have no electricity and no running water on the campus there. But all of the first floors in uh, the ground floors in both buildings have been completely washed out. Um, the destruction is extensive. Um, and um, initially when we built on that campus, that location, we raised the land by about six feet um, because it had a history of flooding up to about four feet. Um, but we never anticipated a surge like this. And, and that's what actually brought the water up. So. It wasn't so much wind damage as much as we, it was the force of the water that actually damaged the first floors of, of both buildings. Windows were washed out. The residential facility that we just opened um, in 2018, um, around March of 2018, was, was practically completely destroyed. We used um, containers to uh, create a residential facility and some of the containers were actually torn away from the building completely and sides of the containers were also torn out. Um, so when we look at the building, when we look at the structure, um, we have to reevaluate and repurpose both buildings going forward. Into there are 537 students on the university's North Campus. 80 of them transferred to the main campus here in the capital, while 58 opted to pursue further studies abroad. Dr. Smith says one of the university's biggest priorities is to ensure that all students receive a good quality education. Several students have accepted offers to other schools in the United States um, to complete this semester only. Um, some students have actually transferred over here to Nassau and we've assisted them with finding housing and getting them in classes. But the majority of the students uh, prefer to stay in Grand Bahama. Uh, some of them lost their homes and they're there, they, they prefer to stay there and provide um, psychological and emotional support to their families as well. But they are determined that they're going to stick together and they're going to rebuild. We have a reopening of, of uh, classes in Grand Bahama um, set for around the 30th of September, the end of this month. Dr. Strawn and the faculty and the administrators over there are working feverishly right now in preparation for that. Classes will be held on the second floor of the um, Teachers Credit Union building in Freeport, as well as in the, Michael, in the Bishop um, Michael Eldon High School. Dr. Smith says some special incentives will be implemented for students and faculty affected by Hurricane Dorian. We were going to make the balance of all of those students on their account zero, um, give them the opportunity to finish the semester. Any student from UB North that might have paid already, we are, we've given them refunds as well. Uh, we've made arrangements for our faculty and staff to get um, salary advances. Um, and, and uh, setting no specific time for them to pay back those salaries. So we are working very, very um, closely with Dr. Strawn and the faculty and staff in, at UB North to make sure that we lend as much assistance as possible. And while they could not give a price tag on the rebuilding process, Dr. Smith says they are now considering a new location for the Freeport campus. Our recommendation is that we repurpose the campus and we've already started getting a lot of inquiries in about the repurposing of it. We're thinking about creating a field research station focusing on climate change, on developing an international climate change institute in Grand Bahama. The university president says while both buildings are insured, it's insufficient to tackle the kind of damages sustained. Health services hard hit by Hurricane Dorian to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. Minister of Health, the Honorable Dr. Dwayne Sands, government will have to revisit its budget after the widespread devastation on Grand Bahama and Abaco. The government had been set to spend several million dollars on renovations to the South Beach Health Center and the Elizabeth Estates Clinic that were set to be transformed into emergency facilities. We're going to have to reprioritize all plan spending. Um, the calculated impact of Hurricane Dorian has exceeded billions of dollars. And as you know, the annual budget of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas is just about two and a half billion dollars. So there will have to be changes in capital allocation, 
how we spend, what we spend, and what our priorities are. Also advising persons in the affected areas not to drink groundwater unless it is treated or boiled, even if water supplies have been restored. He says whether brushing your teeth, cooking or drinking, the preference is bottled water. The Minister of Health also made it clear that despite concerns of communicable diseases in the communities affected by Hurricane Dorian, there have been no cases. We have heard on social, heard and seen on social media, media some very unfortunate uh, almost malevolent, malignant reports of communicable diseases that have not happened. There are no quarantinable diseases. There's specifically no cholera, no dengue that we have seen uh, subsequent to Hurricane Dorian. What is clear, however, is that we have to be vigilant, and as such, with the assistance of PAHO and other uh, teams, environmental health, we have been very aggressive in ensuring that basic public health measures are implemented. Ministry of Works officials viewing the devastation left behind by Hurricane Dorian on the ground yesterday. The Treasure Key Airport terminal, like many buildings on Abaco, was destroyed by the storm. Director of Public Works Melanie Roach says it could be nearly a year before a new facility is built. Roach says officials will have to redesign the terminal building while taking the needs of the airport into consideration. We're going to have to really do the research to see what size the airport needs to be built, um, how many airlines need to be accommodated, how many passengers need to be accommodated, and based on that we will um, commence the design. Um, design usually takes six to eight months to complete and then we would go out to tender and um, start to, for construction. So I don't really anticipate us starting reconstruction of this airport for at least six to eight months. Another body discovered bringing the death toll now to 51. This comes as the search continues in both Abaco and in Grand Bahama. Currently more than 1,000 persons are still missing following the deadly storm. Consideration is now being given to the way ahead for Abaco in terms of rebuilding that community. At least four of the next six months, the rebuilding will take place in key areas. The Prime Minister spoke to the issue yesterday. Here's Jiminita Swain. The Ministry of Environment and Housing has issued a prohibition to build order for the mud, pigeon pea, sand bank and farm road communities in Apico. The restrictions take effect immediately. The Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Dr. Hubert Minnis, says the decision is more for safety reasons. Additionally, he says considerations are being given to a memorial of some sort. Buildings on those areas were inferiorly built and they were um, a setup for disaster. Um, flooding, hurricanes, etc. And they were not built uh, with any safety codes and individuals' lives and um, health was in danger in those type facilities. And we want to ensure that individuals are properly housed and properly proper facility, um, not exposed to all the elements, etc. So um, um, we're discussing the matter at Cabinet now. Um, we think it may be appropriate to declare those areas some form of memorial site in um, respect for those who would have died in those particular areas. Aid continues to pour in from all sectors, but while unable to give a tally on the total received so far, this is what the Prime Minister had to say. We have added additional staff to NEMA. We've um, added an accountant there and we've added additional financial staff so as to monitor, do the necessary invoicing and auditing of what is received. Then, in addition to that, we have a private um, accounting uh, accounting firm or team that would do the necessary audit to ensure that everything, all invoices are there, accountability, transparency is there, and um, they would report regularly to the nation as to the monies that were received and how the monies were, sp were spent. So we have overt accountability, because the one thing I don't want, I don't want nobody calling me no thief. 
The Prime Minister also speaks to the transitional move that will first accommodate those engaged in rebuilding. He was uh, rebuilt and they must be a part of that. They were employed there also. So um, to move their present in shelter and um, we're presently discussing the establishment of a man camp. The man camp would be able to house all um, staff, personnel, individuals, contractors in their staff so that they can rebuild, clean and dial and etc. But um, we must also have what we call um, a tent city. It's not like the tent, that the standard tent that, you're, uh, that you may be familiar with, but a tent city would have bathroom facility, each unit would have two bedroom facility. Um, you have a um, recreation facility, you have a facility for police, um, you have a um, um, dining facility, um, cafeteria facility, so it's really a city. Now, while not providing a timeline as to how soon the relocation process would begin, he did explain why it's important. We feel that it's essential to, um, to move the individuals from New Providence back to this environment with everything, inclusive of, of, of schooling facility, educational facility. And um, that can only remain for a certain any time because um, after six months a year, those individuals will become agitated and want to move into a different type of, of facility. Now the Prime Minister says that the man camp and tent city will be up as soon as possible. Jiminita Swain, ZNS Network News. A close our continued coverage of Hurricane Dorian search and recovery continues right after this. The Ministry of Agriculture and Marine Resources invites all farmers and fishers affected by Hurricane Dorian on the islands of Abaco and Grand Bahama to contact the Department of Agriculture at 397-7450, extension 2200, or the Department of Marine Resources at 393-1777. Important information on the status of your farming or fishing operation is urgently required as we move toward rebuilding and restoration. Every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. we have a show and it's called Conversations with Christ. And it's a really, really good show because it's where we read the Bible and we reflect on it for understanding. And the reason why we do it is because God said to give 10%. But if we only think of the, those 10% tithes as money, then we would be remiss, we'd be incorrect. What God really wants is our time. And so, 6.30 p.m. every Sunday is where we take time out to read God's Word for understanding. So it's that special 10% that we give back to God. I'm here at the Dixon Hill Lighthouse on San Salvador to let you know that marine protected areas make dollars and cents. A well-designed and managed network of protected areas can generate income for nearby communities. From MPA managers to lodges to eco tours, there is money to be made. Healthy marine ecosystems help to protect our islands from climate change and other impacts that we cannot control. Healthy coral reefs help to break down big waves and mangroves absorb storm surge and help to protect our coastline. Older and larger fish tend to carry more and healthier eggs than younger fish. Fish replenishment areas will allow fish to grow bigger and ensure that we have more fish now and in the future. In our replenishment area, fish are free to grow and reproduce. As their populations increase, more fish will spill over into other areas where fishermen can increase their catch and their income. I support the establishment of a marine protected area on my island. I support the establishment of marine protected areas on my island. I support the establishment of marine protected areas on my island. I support the establishment of a marine protected area on my island and you should too. And you should too. And you should too. And you should too. See, See the, the future, future with, with Bahamas, Bahamas Protected. protected. Explore the world of agriculture with us. Join me, your host, Carla Palmer, 
for continued adventures in agriculture and the marine environment as we head into season two of the program, Agriculture Now. That's Agriculture Now, moving to a new date and time, Wednesdays at 8 p.m. and Saturdays at 9 a.m., right here on the ZNS Television Network. Rise and shine, Bahamas. The glory of the Lord is upon you. Tune into the Morning Glory Show with your girl, Divine Lady Vanessa Clark, right here on the Light 810 AM, Monday through Friday from 6 AM to 10.30 AM. Morning Glory, yeah. Mm -hmm. For the latest news and highlights in Bahamian culture, tune in to the new Junkanoo 242, Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. on the ZNS Radio and Television Network. Radio Bahamas, 15.40 a.m. on 104.5 FM and TV 13. Each week, hosts Arlene Nash Ferguson and Darren Bastiat engage his listeners with some of the movers and shakers of Junkanoo and Bahamian culture. Don't miss Junkanoo 242, Saturday at 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. on the ZNS Radio and Television Network. Everybody, I on TV. Look, I on TV. Mom, guess what it is? That's me. Fountain, do you see me? I on television. I gotta tell my girlfriend I on television. Hello? Babe, turn your television to ZNS. Quick, I on television. I don't have a TV in there. We have Wi Fi, though. We have Wi Fi. That, that's fine. They upgrade now. You can watch it live from your phone. You just have to download that. All right, hold on. Go to the app store, type in ZNS. Get your news and more anytime, anywhere with the new ZNS app. Stay connected from around the globe with our live stream news updates all in the palm of your hand. You can also listen to the ZNS radio network for your favorite music. Go into your Apple or Google Play Store and download the ZNS app today. <laughs> My size is starting now, I still got to pay. ZNS Total Sports bringing you excitement, entertainment, energy, pure sports. We're keeping you updated on all the sports happening in the Northern Bahamas. Whether it's soccer, or even the latest results with American football or flag football. Covering baseball, softball, you name it, we'll cover it. Is receiving more aid from its regional partners to assist with hurricane relief. The Bahamian Bermuda Association teaming up with the Bermudian government to donate hundreds of relief supplies. Bermudian Representative Angie Farkerson says Bahamians residing in Bermuda and its citizens were touched by the devastation and were inspired to help. The Bermudian public gave overwhelmingly. We had over 200 tons of items that were given, so much so that we had to uh, seek the assistance of another boat. So we put the initial set of items on the HMS Protector, and that was a British warship. Naval ship. Yeah. Naval ship yeah. that was docked in Bermuda during the time of the hurricane and was headed to Miami. And so they graciously uh, remained in Bermuda while we collected the items and then transported them to the Bahamas for us. Items donated included canned foods, baby wipes, and water. The hurricane relief supplies were distributed to the Ranfilly Home for Children here in the Bahamas, Bahamas Academy, and the Foxo Community Center. Farkerson says this is the first of many items that will be distributed to hurricane victims. It's very important to me because I lived in Grand Bahama and to know that some of the persons that I used to work with, attend church with, and that were my neighbors are impacted by the devastation of the hurricane. It warms my heart that the Bermudian public gave and that we can now come here and be representatives of the Bermudian public to give back to those persons. 
A donation of medical supplies is just the latest aim provided by the Cayman Islands in the wake of Hurricane Dorian. Prime Minister Dr. The Most Honorable Hubert Minnis received the Cayman Premier Alden McLaughlin yesterday at his office extending thanks for the donation. His country would have experienced a great number of hurricanes and um, he understands and knows what are the emergency medical needs um, from experience itself. And as a result, that they were able to donate that type of medication, knowing that we would need it immediately, yes. not only in field hospitals, but we'd need them in our um, communities to ensure that um, the patients would receive the proper medication and there's no, no possibility of shortage of medical supplies. And I want to um, personally thank the Premier and the people of uh, Kingdom for this generous donation. Um, that would definitely help to bring us through and I have reassured them and the world that yes, we may have been struck by uh, an enemy that we could not fight against, but we will persevere and we will come through this. Cayman Premier Alden McLaughlin says it was important for him to personally deliver the aid as a matter of shared experiences with hurricanes and a significant and signifies rather solidarity. They say who feels it knows it. We felt it. Uh, we had two serious hurricanes uh, in the recent past, Ivan and Paloma, that devastated both of uh, our islands, uh, Grand Cayman and Cayman Brack. So we know firsthand what you're going through, although Dorian is, is like no, nothing anyone has ever seen before, quite frankly. And so it was important for us not to be able to just deploy our helicopter and, and crew to help, uh, or indeed just to um, provide some, some support in terms of medical supplies. But I, I wanted to come personally um, to speak to the Prime Minister, whom I know and to convey on behalf of the people of the Cayman Islands and the government of the Cayman Islands our solidarity, our sympathy, and our undertaking to help in any way going forward that we possibly can. The country recorded a double murder overnight. Our Lloyd Allen is joining us live with the latest. Lloyd, what can you tell us? Good morning, LaDon. Well, we're here near the intersection of Glasson Road and Fire Trail Road, where police have reported a double homicide happening overnight. And of course, I have Chief Superintendent Solomon Cash, who's providing some updates on that incident. Good morning, Mr. Cash. What can you tell us? Good, good morning. Good morning, media. Um, sometime around 4 a.m. this morning, uh, the police was alerted um, to this location uh, relative to uh, screams that were emanating from one of the apartment uh, complex uh, here at Glaston Road, just north of Fire Trail Road. Uh, once the police officers arrived on the scene, uh, they ran into one of the units uh, where they discover the lifeless body of uh, two individuals, uh, one adult female and one adult male. Uh, we can only say that from our preliminary investigation that both victims appear to have had some type of blunt force trauma uh, to their bodies. Uh, EMS was called in who pronounced both individuals uh, deceased. Uh, we don't know the circumstances uh, surrounding or the motive surrounding this uh, latest double homicide, but of course we are appealing to members of the public or people who live in the apartment complex uh, that should they have heard anything uh, during the course of the morning uh, to contact the police, uh, police emergency number 911-919 or the central detective unit 502-9992 or 9991. Well, of course, um, obviously uh, you have no leads at this time, uh, but this is uh, just uh, hours away from another uh, um, uh, incident that happened just yesterday morning and before that, another incident, and over the weekend, another uh, two incidents. Uh, what can police say about their efforts uh, uh, as far as fighting crime uh, for these past few days? Uh, let, let me say that uh, we are committed to what we do. Uh, that is uh, to prevent crimes and in cases where the incidents, unfortunate incident that occurs, we are committed to uh, detecting those crimes. And I can tell you we have all our resources on the ground uh, investigating all these incidences. I can tell you that we are following some significant leads as it relates to the Fox Hill uh, matters and also we are following some significant leads as it relates to the 3rd Street uh, matter, the uh, Avocado Street matter and uh, similarly uh, the other incidences of shootings. Uh, we are following some significant leads relative to, to those, those matters. Do you think that there is a gang war, something happening? This is the sixth murder since Saturday and I, I know there would be some concerns of possibly a turf war, something happening. That information has not been brought to the police uh, uh, attention. 
but again, we respect all information that comes to us, and um, given given what you asked just now, we would we would probe that to see if we could uh, unravel whether or not there's some remnants of gang activities. And another question as well. I know you said pre previously uh, yesterday and the uh, incident before that there was a sighting of a Japanese type vehicle. Have you been able to make any progress as far as uh, locating that vehicle? We, we have not made any progress as uh, it relates to locating that vehicle, but I can tell you uh, the significant leads we are following. Uh, I'm strongly uh, of the view that we should soon be uh, taking some persons into custody relative to uh, those incidents. And you said the victims here today, they were found in the house? They found in an apartment, an, an apartment you, complex, one of the units. Any, any idea as to how the perpetrator would have entered the, the, um, it's, the it's, building? It's, it's, it's uncertain how the perpetrator enters the building. As you can see, I have my scenes of crime officers still currently on scene, approving all those avenues. And any age range for the victims? All appear to be in their mid to early 30s. All right, thank you so much. And of course, I will be definitely following this story. Reporting here from the Glasson Road and Fire Trail intersection, Lloyd Allen, ZNS Network News. Thanks a lot, Lloyd. Stay close. We've got more on our continued coverage of Hurricane Dory in search and recovery right after this. Diabetic eye disease is caused by changes in the blood vessels of your retina. This disease is the most common cause of vision loss among patients with diabetes and is the leading cause of blindness and visual impairment in working age adults. Symptoms of diabetic eye disease can include floaters in your vision, blurred vision, fluctuating vision, impaired color vision, or generalized loss of vision. Smoking can quadruple your risk of progression of this disease. Bottom line is, smoking will cause you to go blind faster with diabetes. So quit smoking. Also, for expectant mothers who are diabetic, it is very important that you have your eyes examined during pregnancy, as rapid changes can occur in your eyes during pregnancy. And remember, good eye health is a combined effort between your eye care team, your medical doctors, and you, the patient. This public service announcement is brought to you by the Public Hospitals Authority in conjunction with the Medical Association of the Bahamas and the Broadcasting Corporation of the Bahamas. <coughs> Everybody, I on TV. Look, I on TV. Mom, guess what it is? That's me. Paul, do you see me? I on television. I got to tell my girlfriend I on television. Hello? Babe, turn your television to ZNS. Quick, I on television. I don't have a TV in there. We have Wi Fi, though. We have Wi-Fi. That, that's fine. They upgrade now. You can watch it live from your phone. You just have to download the app. All right, hold on. Go to the app store, type in ZNS, download the app, and you'll be able to watch it straight from your phone. Are we on the phone over there? Get your news and more anytime, anywhere with the new ZNS app. Stay connected from around the globe with our live stream news updates, all in the palm of your hand. You can also listen to the ZNS radio network for your favorite music. Go into your Apple or Google Play Store and download the ZNS app today. Besides the star now, I still gotta pay. A local bank is providing more assistance to organizations on the front line of Hurricane Dorian relief efforts. CIBC First Caribbean International Bank's charity arm, Comtrust, presented a $100,000 check to the Red Cross Society. CIBC CEO and Comtrust Chair Colette Delaney says that they are committed to assisting in the rebuilding efforts. We have an unwavering commitment to our staff and clients in the Caribbean and we're determined to do all that we can to facilitate them as they rebuild their lives, homes, and businesses. To this end, we've put together a suite of special loans, deferred payments, and other concessions aimed at helping both our staff, retail, and corporate clients, credit card holders, and other Bahamians who qualify to receive this special financial assistance. We've also partnered with the University of the West Indies Cave Hill Campus to offer immediate support to 17 students from the Abacos Islands in Grand Bahama whose lives were upended by the storm but who will still travel to the campus in Barbados to commence their studies. Be rest assured that we're with you, we're with you for the long haul. 
Red Cross President Therese Curry thanked CIBC for the donation, saying that it will be used to assist them in carrying out their mandate, which includes serving the community and helping those in need. It's a pleasure to accept this generous donation on behalf of the Bahamas Red Cross Society. CIBC First Caribbean has been a corporate partner with the Red Cross over the years, providing assistance where necessary for the continuation of the work of the Red Cross. We are partnering with our global network of Red Cross Red Crescent societies who are here to support and assist us in this effort. So together we are rolling out a major humanitarian effort. And it is with corporate partners and donors such as yourself that we are able to carry out our mandate to alleviate human suffering wherever it may be found and to provide humanitarian aid to everyone. Meantime, on the ground in Abaco, some residents remain there hoping to pick up the pieces. They spoke to our Lloyd Allen. Uh, since the storm, um, uh, uh, obviously our uh, uh, residents are still here trying to rebuild, but what are some of those challenges that you still face? So far, the challenge in this been trying to protect the stuff because we have no help from the government or trying to protect the people from stealing and stuff. So that is the biggest problem we got. The it's problem is we, there's not enough um, security. I mean, we have all kinds. We have the U.S., we have the British, we have Dutch, we have German. The defense force and the police can't do it on their own. And, you know, apparently our government hasn't given the other countries the leeway to help with the security part, on the, only the humanitarian part of delivering food. Yeah. The people who's got generators, what could, could patrol this place, we can't get no fuel. That is the problem. And they got boats running in there, in and out, and will not bring no fuel to the people here in Marsh Arbor. About how uh, the nights have been really, uh, um, I don't know if you've had power, but how have your nights have been really just trying to now move forward? Um, we're just struggling and trying to stay and protect what we still have. We, that's our house. Our four villas are gone. My personal house that I had on rental is basically destroyed, but that's the only thing we have left right there, that one villa. And we have a generator, which we fortunately is still running and we were able to get water um, in our holding tank so um, we we're able to stay as long as we could get the fuel the water and you know we do have some food supply still left so we, we plan on staying and we just hope that the, we start seeing things happening i see they're starting to clean the town there's a few bulldozers but you've seen our town our town is basically destroyed every building we need a lot more heavy equipment. We need the manpower. We need people to start coming in and helping. I see you do have some workers here as well, assisting uh, with some of the yeah. yard work. Well, how, uh, how helpful has that been? Very helpful, but these guys, Floyd owns a construction company. So these guys work with his construction company and they've stayed to help us try to repair the roof on the villa that we did save because there is some roof damage. And his son's house had some roof damage, which they've been able to help us. So we, we're controlling the leaking in the homes now. But yeah, they've been very helpful, very helpful. Some Haitian nationals who have resided in Abaco and Freeport for more than four decades decided not to evacuate and remain on those affected islands for many reasons. One of them is a lack of family connection on the islands where shelters are located. Marketing officer of the United Haitian Community Front, Pastor Robertson Duodonan, says while the situation is unfortunate, the decision to remain on the devastated islands is their choice. I watched somebody who's been in Abaco for I think 35 years, he goes, where would I go? I don't know nobody in Nassau. This is not an illegal, undocumented person. This is a person whose kids lived in the United, lives in the United States, but just happens to have no family in Abaco. I met someone who's been in Abaco for 40 years. He said, well, I, I'm living now in a church, but why go to Nassau to leave the church, which is livable, to go to Nassau? Where he, technically, he's a complete stranger. He doesn't have a relation. We, we watch persons come up, come with their shelters overloaded, walking up and down on East Street, who don't have a place to go. They, not everybody is connected with somebody in Nassau. 
To ensure that Haitian nationals are stabilized and are able to remain functional as they start the rebuilding process, members of the United Haitian Community Front will be offering mental health counseling services for all displaced by Hurricane Dorian. Treasurer of the United Haitian Community Front, Edward St. Fleur. Many, um, especially the children, they have been traumatized. And um, we have an organization that's ready to assist us um, in providing counseling, either one-to-one -one or group counseling, so that we can help them to uh, debrief, to um, um, get into the proper uh, mind frame to continue their education, that's for the children, and of course the parents. Uh, one of the persons that have been assisting us, uh, Pastor Barrington Brennan, he has put up this particular flyer, Emotional Wellness After a Hurricane, um, from which we gathering a lot of material in order to help. Mercy chefs are providing hot meals for persons in shelters here in the capital. They have been serving up thousands of lunches and dinners, dinner meals rather, every day for the past 10 days. President and founder of Mercy Chefs, Gary LeBlanc, spoke to our news team about why they came to assist in this hurricane relief effort. You know, if you look at the devastation of this storm, if you just look at the humanity that was affected, I don't know how anyone could not come and help. The evacuees that are coming onto the island are coming with nothing. Many have not eaten in days or had a hot meal in days. So when they get their first meal, we want to make sure that it's a beautifully prepared, chef-crafted meal, something that we're proud to serve and they'll be happy to eat. Chef LeBlanc added that some of their teams consist of locals. We have seven of our Mercy Chefs team here from the United States, but we always think it's important to work with the local people, to work with the folks that we're serving. So we have invited volunteers into the kitchen with us. We also have hired about six or seven Bahamians that were out of work and put them to work in the kitchen. In addition, the students that are here at the National Training Agency in the hospitality program are able to come and work with us and satisfy their requirement for their internship. So in all, we have 25 to 30 people working here every day. And of that, only seven are Mercy Chefs. The balance are Bahamian. A national oil spill committee has been appointed to deal with the oil spillage over in Grand Bahama. The special group began its work yesterday and will take a wide spoke of the potential damage to that community. Meanwhile, a national prayer service for the nation in wake of Hurricane Dorian will take place tomorrow evening at the Bahamas Faith Ministries International. The service will be led by the Bahamas Christian Council President Bishop Delton Fernander. We're asking that all Bahamians would come out this Wednesday as we gather in the solemn assembly simply to call on our God to offer prayer and praise to the God of our salvation. We've come through a traumatic event and we need to unite as a people as we present this Bahamas back to our God. Our Prime Minister has called on the Council of Churches and so we gather as an ecumenical body so that we can lift our country to God. And we're inviting all Bahamians, all denomination, all race, all creed, join us as we pray to our God. About 5,000 young people leave the public school system every year. Now, according to the Minister of Youth, Sports and Culture, the Honorable Lanisha Roll, her team is doing all they can to not only provide programs, but to also map out new strategies that will keep young people off the unemployment line. My biggest concern is uh, the need for us to engage at a national level uh, in terms of investment in youth, youth projects. Youth projects that will ensure that the youth are positively engaged on a constant basis. Why is a project rather than programs? Because projects have a specific outcome. Um, they can be more definitively measured and monitored. And there is, there is a greater level of accountability. And so I believe if we sort of have these short-term six months, a six-month project to accomplish this or to accomplish that, we have a lot of young people that are dying at the hand of crime, the vicious hand of crime. Um, but I 
believe that they are, are positively engaged through projects and um, followed by, by programs later on, I believe that the persons, would, young people would be positively engaged, we would save lives, and they would have a better prospect for their future. And a new replacement diesel starting engine for Bahamas Power and Light arrived on the island on Monday and officials at BPL hope to have them in operation by the end of the month. After a hot summer plagued with numerous bouts of load shedding, officials at BPL say they anticipate the new machinery for Unit 1 along with two new generation specialists that also arrived on Monday and have been engaged through the company's U.S. partners will reinvigorate the forward movement on the units. BPL says once the engine arrived, a team immediately began preparations for alignment and installation. BPL says it also hopes to have at least one of two units at the Blue Hill Power Station operational by the final week in September. Stay Close Sports is up next with Charles Fisher. Hey, long time no see. You hear me? Long time. No sea. Ball fish, stew fish, stew conch. I love it all. Tourists come here to take our tours, experience our sun, sand, and sea, and they also spend money around town. I used to see a bunch of hogfish around here, but nowadays I hardly see any. You protect one area, the fish do their thing, make a bunch of babies that spread all over the sea. What's the problem? If we protect certain parts of our sea, it keeps all parts working right. I was against that phrase, but knowing what I know now, I totally agree with having marine protected areas. I support marine protected areas. We support marine protected areas. Look for Bahamas Protected on Facebook. Sign the petition. Sign the petition. <laughs> Our marine resources were once considered inexhaustible. Conch and reef fish like grouper were abundant everywhere, and it seemed as if the lobster catch would rise forever. But today, there is a downward trend that affects everyone. Researchers say we can reverse the trend by protecting more marine habitats. And the good news is that most Bahamians strongly support efforts to halt further decline. Tripling the size of our network of marine parks will mean more fish and conch for everyone now and for the future, as well as more recreational and ecotourism opportunities. Today, only 10% of our waters are protected. Surveys show that most Bahamians consider protection of our marine environment to be a top national priority. More protection means more benefits for everyone, now and in the future. It's a win-win-win strategy for the economy, for Bahamians, and for nature. Protect our sea, protect our way of life, protect the Bahamas. See the future. Visit Bahamas Protected on Facebook to learn more about marine protected areas. Welcome to the best of sports world. everybody out there 10 days to go to the start of the IWF World Track and Field Championships in Doha and still Team Bahamas trying to get the $116,000 needed to send the 18 member contingent to the games. Speaking with B3H President Jamiko Acha late last night they have yet to get the funds and now the question arises what will happen if Team Bahamas is not in Qatar? It would be uh a tragedy for Team Bahamas. It would be uh, most unfortunate for the 
the perception of the country, uh, who is seen within our region as one of the leaders, uh, and certainly um, one of those countries who fight among the big, big giants and uh, victorious. And so, in addition to that, I think that the country rides on the hopes and the, the dreams of these athletes to inspire them in a time when we find ourselves in the doldrums. Uh, Dorian doesn't make it any better for us, but I believe that this would be the one scintilla of hope that we are getting to a place because we are a resilient nation and the country needs to see examples of that. Well, Ronald Cartwright is one of the assistant coaches and will also be honored by the IWF with the veterans pin for his more than 45 years of contribution to the sport, primarily in the area of field events. There was one time the Bahamas dominated the world scene in field events. Of the nine members on this year's team, only three will compete in the field. I do know that we are lacking of that type of athletes. If you notice the structure of the athletes we had before, we're not getting those kind of people. We are getting people who want basketball, football, and that's it. Track and field for some reason is put on the back. But you know why? Honestly, I don't have the answer. But um, it's not all. It's not all lost. You know, it's still there's some good athletes around, and we just need uh, coaches. How do you convince an athlete to go to, go into the field event where it's not much glamour? They doing the shot, but ain't nobody watching. Are they doing traveling discs? Cause nobody watching, but everybody watching track. Most times you don't do it. Most times they come to you. If an athlete believe that because I am big, I have to throw. Some people believe because I swim, I have to sprint or run long distance, not necessarily so. Some of the very, very good shows in the world are not very big fat people. It's speed. Until they got that, get that concept that we don't have to be big, I think uh, we have better athletes, more athletes coming to the coaches of, in terms of the throws. But that is uh, our problem right here. But we, we have um, a young group of kids right now coming up because I have at least five kids in, in my club right now who I believe will make the career of the team if not this thing next year and they're only like 12 13 but they are really 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 good they're not big but I think most of them come to you to answer your question you don't go for them or you might see somebody with a structure and say well man I think I could do something with that but most of them come to me as a, as a showing coach with only New Providence, Andy Luther playing softball at this time and with the destruction left by Hurricane Dorian to the islands of Abaco and Grand Bahama, Bahama Softball Federation President Ted Miller has come to a fast pitch decision regarding the BSF Round Robin Nationals usually held at the end of October. What we intend to do is to uh, hold a national all-star tournament uh, with hoping that we could get all the other islands that, not, that are not affected in and make it a fundraiser so that we can assist the islands of Grand Bahama and, and Abaco in, in their efforts to, to re rebuild. Bahamas Bodybuilding and Fitness Federation naming its team for the Central American and Caribbean Bodybuilding Championships October 11th through the 4th teeth in the Dominican Republic. Shakira Ferguson, Tanza Thompson, Fania Joseph, David Domaville, Demetrius Clark, Keith Johnson, Jason Johnson, Wellington Wallace, Dominic Hanna, Charles Rackley, Don Charlton, Bertram Miller, the head coach is Raymond Tucker. The team will be managed by Leonardo Dean. And John Curl Jones and the Connecticut Sun open WNBA semifinal play this evening at 6.30, hosting the the LA Sparks in the three games played this season each team has won on its home court with two-thirds of the games being played in LA and by the way all ticket sales from this game goes towards Hurricane Dorian relief efforts once again that game tips off at 6 30 this evening and that's going to do it for sports I'm Charles Fisher thanks for watching and have yourself a great day Abuse, domestic violence, suicidal tendencies. Are you being stressed out from these problems? Call the National Hotline at 422-2763 or 322-2763. There are trained social workers available 24 hours to help you. Know that you are not alone in this.
this. Oh, I'm not the cold one. Pasta! Pasta! Don't you know you guys are breaking the law by not using your seat belts? Man, Charlie, man, I'm using my seat belt. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong! The seat belt is not for opening your alcoholic drink. It is for saving lives. And by the way, for those of you who continue to drink and drive, we're on the lookout for you too. In our final look at weather, Humberto now 570 miles uh, west of Bermuda, moving toward the uh, east northeast at around 8 miles by the maximum sustained wind, still holding at 90 miles bar. And we have that troughing right now across the central Bahamas, so that will fire up some showers and thunderstorms, which will be heavier times around the Exumas, Long Island, and uh, Cat Island. They will be in the mix as that troughing continues to drag along with Humberto towards the east. And we're looking at another system. Uh, just in the corner of our satellite picture there, and that's an area of low pressure that's looking quite impressive over the next uh, 24 hours or so. This could become a tropical depression, possibly even a tropical storm within the next uh, day or two. But certainly in the long term, that is over a five-day period, we have about a 90% chance of that system developing. It will continue moving towards the west, so we'll keep our eyes on that system over the next uh, few days. And the forecast track for Humberto will take it uh, well to the north and west of Bermuda sometime on Thursday morning. So that island nation will get some strong gusty winds and uh, heavy rains uh, later on in the week. And our forecast for today calls for a mix of clouds and sunshine, more sunshine than clouds. But there will be a couple of showers still looking around. High temperature getting up to 87 degrees. And tonight we are looking at near clear skies. Things will be clearing out at this, as that trough continues to pull away from the capital. Low temperature getting down to 79 degrees. And extended weather forecast over the next few days. One or two showers still looking around on Wednesday. A lot better on Thursday. Friday we get a couple showers developing as things start to increase uh, rain-wise. On Saturday we're looking for scattered showers with isolated thunderstorms in the forecast. So once again, if you're planning activities for Saturday, it does not seem as though this is going to be the best Saturday for that. Hold on. Thanks a lot, Basil. And that does it for us this Tuesday. See you right back here tomorrow morning at 6.30 for our continued coverage of Hurricane Dorian's search and recovery. On behalf of the entire morning team, I'm LaDawn Davis. Make it a great day, everyone.